August 7, 1979, American commercial divers Richard Walker and Victor Yule were lowered 485 feet below the surface at a thistle oil field in East Shetland, Scotland. What was seen as a routine dive turned into one of the biggest disasters the diving industry has ever seen. A single anchor leg mooring system began development in February 1975 by Burma Oil. It was formulated by Exxon Research and Engineering of New Jersey and built by Motherwell Bridge Offshore in Leith, Scotland. It cost around $6.5 million to build, the equivalent of $32 million for today's standards. In March 1977, it was set into position by subsea international divers. Now, you may be wondering what the Psalm actually does. In theory, the Psalm would allow companies to transport oil from the thistle field offshore to a submarine export pipeline. The Psalm was 545 feet long, made up of about three different sections. The first was a 182-foot upper section called the buoy. The second was a 335-foot-long mill section called the riser. And the last one was a hex-shaped gravity base, which anchored the facility to the bottom of the ocean to ensure that the entire thing didn't float away. By January 1979, the buoy had become partially disconnected from the riser. The British National Oil Corporation had the buoy blown free of the riser with explosives and taken to Amsterdam for repairs, but the explosive charges damaged the riser. In April 1979, the riser was removed from the base by divers and taken to Bergen, Norway to be repaired. But there was something a bit more devious going on behind the scenes. Investigative journalist Brian Gould discovered that during the Psalms repairs, English businessman Brian Masterson awarded in Fabco a contract for diving services from the drill rig Gulnair alongside the Thistle Alpha platform. Investigative reporter Brian Gould would later discover the possibility that Masterson had bribed BNOC officials for contracts, rushing the repair process in order to maintain a steady profit. On June 18, 1979, BNOC contracted with Infabco to reinstall the Psalm on its base in the Thistle Field, but this reinstallment was littered with irresponsible practices and just sheer ignorance. The swivel that connected the lift wire to the bell was replaced with a pair of less than adequate shackles, the clump weight that served as a backup recovery system was removed, and there was also now no bell stage to keep the bottom hatch out of the mud if the bell were to become stranded at the bottom of the ocean. In short, every single precaution that was put into place to avoid catastrophe was stripped away. Which brings us back to the night of August 7th, 1979. Professional divers Richard Walker and Victor Yule were tasked with the job of reattaching the Psalm to its base. However, as the bell was lowered into the ocean, its transponder came loose and the deck foreman was ordered to cut it free. Early the next morning, while still beneath the surface, Richard Walker noticed that the bell had been separated from its lift wire and immediately reported the emergency. Understanding the danger this now posed, he scrambled to rejoin Yule and the bell. The two decided their best course of action would be to seal the inside door, as to conserve oxygen and hopefully last until they could be rescued. The bell had a life support umbilical cord, and dive supervisors Peter Holmes and Brian Reed believed that this cord was the correct line of protection for these two divers. It was not. Reed and his crew attempted to raise the bell with the already damaged umbilical, which resulted in the cord becoming jammed between a rubber tire and a side plate. Even after becoming further jammed, the crew decided to try and raise the bell, and this only more severely damaged the umbilical. This attempt resulted in the bell's access to power and hot water being cut off, and the crew ended up lowering the bell even further, 522 feet below the surface. What followed in the coming days were multiple attempts to rescue Walker and Yule. The diving vessel Stena Welder arrived to render assistance in the rescue, but its diving system was undergoing repairs and had to be hastily readied for diving. Holmes and Brian Masterson elected to try and raise the bell with the Bull Drake's crane, a wildly ridiculous and careless decision. This necessitated that the Stena Welder rescue divers had to attach a guide wire to the bell, which would then be used to send the Bull Drake crane hook to the bell, allowing the rescue diver to attach it to the bell with a wire sling. If it sounds confusing hearing it, you better believe it was confusing those who had to carry it out. The Stena Welder's diving bell plunged into the depths of the ocean with rescue divers Phil Casey Smith and Eddie Frank, but this attempt was anything but smooth. Light failure on the bell, communication issues, the absence of the Will Drake's bell transponder, and not to mention that the Will Drake's crew had forgotten they moved the bell away from the Psalm base just hours prior. With all of these extenuating circumstances at play, it took the Stena Welder over an hour to find the Will Drake's bell. 
Casey Smith headlined the charge, directing the recovery of the slack guide wire around the SOM base. Casey Smith tried to move as fast as possible, since he could see inside of the Wildrake's bell and was aware of how much more frantic Walker and Yule's movements were becoming. Casey Smith was finally able to attach the guide wire around the base, and the Wildrake attempted to lift the bell from the bottom at a 45 degree angle instead of vertically, and they did so without any sort of visual verification. During the lift, the bell wedged against the side of the psalm base, causing the wire sling to snap in half. When the end of the crane wire emerged from the ocean, it was without the Wildrake bell, which, yet again, was lost. Eddie Frank ventured back into the ocean and relocated the bell. While down there, he saw that Walker or Gule had attempted to cut the ropes on the drop weights to allow the bell to surface, but that only one of the two weights was cut free. He also saw that the stranded divers were nearing their final moments. Divers Michael Mangan and Tony Slayman relieved the now exhausted Casey Smith and Frank. Mangan was able to reconnect the crane wire to the bell, and it was lifted out of the ocean and docked at the Wildrake saturation system. It was here that Dr. Morvan White examined Walker and Yule, and determined that the two divers were no longer breathing. Dr. George Sheriffs further examined the two divers, and concluded that the two had died of hypothermia. The following day, the Department of Energy deployed inspectors and police on board of the Wildrake to initiate an investigation. The DOE discovered multiple safety violations and evidence of negligence. Walker's wife and Gule's family filed a wrongful death complaint. A year later, on November 28, 1980, Infabco was indicted on criminal charges, and a criminal charge ensued. Infabco's defense was the claim that the divers were employed by a different company, and they were not employed by Infabco at the time of their deaths. On December 19, 1980, Sheriff Alistair Stewart ruled that the Crown had failed to prove that Infabco was Walker and Gule's employer. He therefore directed the jury to find Infabco not guilty. Sheriff Douglas James Risk issued his final conclusions on the case, stating that he found that the removal of the clump weight contributed to the divers' deaths, and that the absence of a bell stage indicated that the divers' contractors were more concerned with speed than with safety. He also concluded that Walker and Yule could probably have been saved if Masterson had not ordered the crane lift to continue without investigating the obstruction impeding the lift, which proved to be the psalm base. In May 1981, the United States District Court in Los Angeles awarded compensatory damages of $475,000 to Walker's widow and daughter, and $75,000 to Gule's family. An inquiry was held for Walker and Gule's deaths May 11th and 12th, 1981 in Aberdeen. At the inquiry, Walker's widow, Jeanne Walker, read aloud the final entry from her husband's diary that was recovered after his death, written on August 7th, 1979. He wrote out the chilling confession. I don't even know if I'm going to get out of here alive. No admission of wrongdoing was ever made by the defendants.